Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure exactly who to, who to uh, thank, uh, but uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, I appreciate all the, all the recognition and, uh, I've been getting. Um, uh, actually, I'm told that the uh, Abba Laureate last year came in and said he wasn't going to give the talk he prepared. He'd stayed up all night the night before and made a new one. Well, I, I, I changed the title of my talk uh, Monday, but uh, it, it's now glimpses into the calculus of variations. But um, I, I've been working longer than that on the talk. Uh, I, I, <laughs> uh, I hope, I, 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 hope um, I, I'm, I know I'm a dinosaur. Um, I, uh, I uh, never really got made it into the, technolo into the technical, uh, into technology. But, uh, and uh, I think the outline of the talk is a little ambitious. And uh, I, I hope, but I would like to get to, to point eight. So um, I also want to say that I, my, um, uh, one of my stories has been stolen twice already now. <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, we'll start. Uh, the calculus of variations has, has well, you'll, under, you'll understand, I hope, by the end of the talk, that the calculus of variations isn't always about minimizing things. But uh, conceptually, it starts with questions of minimizing things. And uh, I found, uh, I did also did research on the web because this is a general talk and I needed entertaining stories and so forth. And I found all sorts of stuff on the web. And let me tell you, don't trust Wikipedia. The university websites are far more reliable. And anyway, but I found somewhere on the web, and I'll never, I couldn't find it again, so I couldn't give you the reference. The question found on the web is, do animals do math? Mathematics, they seem to know the shortest distance between two points is along a straight line. So that's the first example that we all know of a minimization problem. Okay. And um, now, if you look in uh, Greek mathematics, uh, they actually don't talk about, at least Euclid doesn't talk about shortest distances. Uh, he ta uh, it, they actually make a lot of constructions that are shortest distances. For example, the fact that you can drop, that, uh, the sh uh, that you can drop a, per uh, a perpendicular from a point to a plane, or um, in fact, uh, the, the most complicated one uh, is that uh, you, you can uh, draw, draw a line between, if you have two seg lines in space, skew lines in space that, you, and, and that don't intersect, they actually uh, have, a, have a, a, a line perpendicular to both of them, which, and, and that of course does realize the shortest distance. But it is certainly a statement by Aristotle that the shortest distance between two points is along a straight line. So that, that's the first uh, quote. Uh, the Greeks didn't have a good description of arbitrary curves. I mean, this is what mathematics is for, is it tells you how to describe things, and they didn't do it. Uh, but they gave lots of these constructions, and they did have the machinery to prove that these were uh, the shortest, the, the, the constructions they made were indeed the shortest paths among all piecewise linear paths, that is, broken straight lines. And it's interesting, because we'll come back to the, that, that in 10 BCE, he, uh, Heron proved that the shortest path between, uh, between two points with any number of in, uh, reflecting mirrors. That's typical mathematics, right? You do it for one mirror, and then you say, oh, yeah, but I can do it for any number. And so uh, any number uh, uh, is, is, is gotten by... Um, if you want to find the, the di distance through the mirror, you actually reflect the point through the mirror. We'll come back to this. And you actually draw the straight line, and then you reflect the line. So uh, that's uh, okay. But um, so uh, we want to have some women in this talk. So um, uh, uh, Dido's problem is uh, in, uh, from Virgil the Aeneid, which is 10 BCE. And the question is, uh, the question asked is, the story is, is that she was uh, a princess in Tyre, and uh, she had some uh, difficulties with her brother. And so she sailed off looking for, to found a new city, and she uh, uh, arrived on the coast of, um, 
uh, uh, sorry, uh, Car Carthage. Right. And uh, she met the barbarians there and asked for some land, and she asked for the amount of land that she could, uh, 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 you can enclose in a hide of a bull. And the, uh, so they said, oh, sure, this silly woman will give her what she wants. And so she, uh, uh, the first part is, uh, Clever, but the second part is mathematics. She cut the hide into very long, thin strips. And of course, uh, nowadays we would say as mathematicians, we can cut them into infinitely thin strips and we get an infinitely long line. But uh, the, uh, the, Greeks, the Greeks weren't that ambitious. And then she arranged the strip in a circle. And today, this uh, fact that the circle if you have a, a length of string and you uh, want to enclose the biggest area inside it, uh, you would arrange that in uh, a circle, and that is called the isoparametric inequality. And it's, of course, been extended to many other different kinds of geometry. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because, again, since the Greeks didn't have the description of curves, they couldn't actually prove this but uh, in, in 150 BCE, the, uh, Zenodorus gave a rigorous proof that if you did this with an n-gon, that is, and again, that, that was, they were ambitious, any number of sided thing, that the, that the, the solution was the regular uh, n-gon with even sides. Now, right now, maybe this is the time to explain what variation means in the calculus of variations. So, we're, we're, gonna, we're going to be dido, and we have uh, a long strip of bull hide that we've uh, cut and tied it up. And we've uh, ranged it down, and we want to know uh, how, to, how to think that the circle is the answer. Well, if we lay it down, and we want to know, can we make it shorter, uh, can we close more area? What we do is, is we actually choose a direction and we move the string in that direction and we calculate the difference in the area. Now, this motion is actually in uh, the... Uh, and we would actually, in modern days, we'd assign a parameter to that motion. People often say time, but that's confusing because time, it isn't time. It's an external parameter. And uh, you move the external param uh, in this and you see if the area changes. And in fact, so you actually, what you do in modern days is you calculate the derivative of the area along that, that motion. And if the derivative is zero, like for a circle, we, we, we know that, uh, uh, we, we don't know that it's a minimum, but we do know that, uh, we didn't know there's no obvious counterexample. Whereas if it's not a minimum, then we know we move it in this direction and it get, becomes, becomes less. And so um, uh, uh, that's our test for a minimum. Okay. okay. So now we come to, uh, we go back to Zenodorus and, um, uh, so Fermat and, and so this is a big skip in time. We're going to have several big skips in time. Uh, Fermat in uh, 1662 um, uh, uh, derived the laws of reflection and refraction. He claimed that um, uh, that uh, light travels from P to Q along the path of, the, uh, of shortest length. And again, uh, in, in the, the, the path, the, the, this is this is uh, 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 this is uh, Heron again. That is, you want to go from P to Q. And uh, by the way, notice it's not a minimum. Notice that if you were to draw the straight line from P this to P to Q here, it would be less time. So what you do is you reflect Q to Q prime, draw the straight line, and then reflect the line. And again, you, the laws of refraction are derived um, uh, if you have the, the light travels with a different velocity in this medium from, this, from the top medium to the bottom medium, then um, 
uh, the, the, the past still takes the least time. And so you can think about it a little bit, about I drew this picture on purpose, and you can decide which, where, which where, is the velocity smaller here, or, uh, larger here or here. From the picture, you should be able to tell. But I found it very interesting because, and, and especially because the law, uh, rules about the laws of physics are very, very much based on conceptually uh, minimizing things. And in the same year, so we skipped a, long gen a, lot of, a lot of centuries there, but in the same year, de Chambre wrote to Fermat that the principle you take as the basis of your proof, namely that nature always acts by using the simplest and shortest path, is merely moral and not physical, and cannot be the cause of any effect in nature. Well, you can think about that because, <laughs> okay. Now we come to the, you know, uh, brachistochrome problem. Um, uh, oh. oh, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> The, this is the one that, that my thunder has been stolen here. So the question is, is what is the curve along which a particle falls from P to Q under the influence of gravity in the shortest time? And um, uh, I don't actually know why this question came up, and I never heard before I came to Oslo that it was called the ski jump problem. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what is interesting is, is that Galileo, was able to compute that a circle was better than a straight line. That is, it, it was faster, but, and he actually proposed that that was the solution. But, uh, so it's good to know that, uh, that uh, uh, great ma uh, mathematicians make mistakes. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and uh, Johann Bernoulli in June of 1969 posed this as a challenge problem. Uh, I understand, again, I don't know how much you believe when you read this on the web, but uh, uh, it, 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 it's claimed that he actually knew the solution at this point. And he, uh, he, I also listed at the familiar people, his brother also submitted a solution, and there was a lot of controversy. So mathematics has never been a peaceful subject. And uh, both Leibniz, L'Hopital, and Newton submitted uh, 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 solutions. And I, the story of Newton is, is um, very, very, very uh, um, uh, I don't know, it's supposed to be apocryphal. So. But he received the problem in the mail when he came back from a hard day at the Mint. You know, he was, and uh, uh, by 12, uh, 12 hours later, he solved it, and he submitted it anonymously. And when Burley, Ber Bernoulli got the solution, uh, he read it, and he said, we recognize the lion by his paw. Okay, and actually, I have a challenge for you, because this just needs calculus. But uh, I, 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 uh, first of all, you have to set the problem up, which is not trivial. And I don't actually know how Galileo did that. But anyway, you have to set the problem up, and then you have to do a nasty integration. And I'm not going to tell you what the answer is, and I challenge you if you can do it, because it's not that easy. Uh, and, and, if you do, and if you don't really know physics, you probably wouldn't think of the right way to go about it. <laughs> so... So we get into the really things. Um, uh, so we jump again, but not, not quite so much, uh, to 1744. Uh, By 1744, both Euler and Malpertus had formulated calculus variations problems that attempted to describe uh, Newton's laws. So Newton, Newton, uh, Newton, I should say, Newton actually, uh, the first calculus of variations problem is not the Brachistochrome. Apparently, he tried to compute, uh, he, he formulated a problem about the shape of a, sol a rotationally symmetric solid that you could move through the air. We don't remember, and, and he actually set it up and solved it. The thing is, is the physics was wrong. So we don't remember that problem anymore. But in any case, um, <coughs> uh, 
uh, by, uh, uh, by 7044, uh, everybody was working at this point. There was a whole gang of these people out there. I mean, thinking of these lonely people lonely out back there, of course, they took longer to communicate with each other. But uh, uh, so, uh, and in fact, Merpertus Mar is actually uh, often quoted as the person to first derive the, the least action, uh, least energy principle. But um, Euler, Euler proposed, uh, uh, I'll give you Euler's proposal, and um, here uh, the physics quantities uh, are um, position, which is a function of t. I've used q equal f of t. That's not the classical notation. q is the classical notation, but I, we're going to see f throughout the talk. So remember f. f is the thing we're looking for in the whole talk. So uh, we, we, we write down an A of A, and A is actually what we're going to minimize. So keep that in mind. And, that, that. and um, uh, so uh, uh, the physics quantity is uh, 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 Q and the position, uh, the velocity, and the velocity is the derivative, and the momentum is mass times the derivative, and the function is an arbitrary function of time fixed in space at the endpoints. But we've actually forgotten that because in 1762, Lagrange gave the form, and everybody immediately dropped what they were doing and grabbed onto what his idea. And uh, so he, he, he actually wrote down uh, an action. This is A for action, so that's classically in physics action. So um, uh, you minimize the action integral, and here F can be any function. I mean, L can be any function doesn't have to have any meaning whatsoever. You know, we're mathematicians. We can do anything we want. And if you've never wondered why people do mathematics, you should realize that. Uh, if you're a physicist, you have to make sense of L. If you're a mathematician, you can do anything. So formally, uh, and, and so in, in mechanics, uh, L is the difference of kinetic energy and potential energy. So it is not a question of minimizing energy. It that minimizes the difference. And he derived the Euler-Lagrange equations, which look like this. And uh, uh, again, uh, these, this is one of the few equations we'll see in the class. You, you take, th this is uh, grammatically totally incorrect, but uh, most people understand. You, you have to take a partial derivative of L in the direction of the velocity, and then, then you, you take the derivative of that whole thing, and that's the partial derivative of L in the direction of F. Uh, these are purely stationary solution. Uh, sta uh, these are called critical or stationary, and they're purely formal. They can have no physical meaning whatsoever, or you, they can, you can have something that's not a minimum in any, in any sense, and it still has meaning. Uh, 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 <clears throat> so. so, we have to skip a whole lot. I'm sorry, there's, there's a lot of good stories and so forth, but if I'm going to get uh, anywhere near the mo uh, uh, today, we're going to skip, okay? And we're going to go back to least distance, okay? And, and uh, something is least distance, uh, and we have to also talk about where it's least distance, okay? So modern mathematics uh, in geometry uh, usually deals with something called a manifold. Now, that sounds pretty terrible, but of course, uh, the, the, the um, uh, 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 Lagrange and uh, so forth, uh, and the, uh, the, the physicists from way back, uh, you, of course, knew about some manifolds because they wrote, uh, uh, they wrote z is equal to g of x, y, and thought of that as a surface in space. And... Uh, you also can write the, uh, ma the manifold as given as implicit function, the g of three coordinates uh, is, uh, a function of three coordinates is zero, and the gradient doesn't vanish. You have to use the implicit function theorem, so if th those of you, uh, and, uh, and these were studied, I mean, I, I didn't even look up the history because, and they, they, they actually just le uh, yield uh, the Euler-Lagrange equations that we already saw, and there's something called the Lagrange multiplier that's thrown in there, so it's a little bit more complicated. And uh, you can generalize, see, we're mathematicians, we can do anything we want. So we put any number of variables, we change x, y, and z to x1, x2, and so forth, xn, and we change
change the w to any number of uh, variables. And this, this uh, now this might seem, maybe there's something that we want to call a Riemannian manifold that isn't described this way, but it's a theorem of Nash. And Nash is one of the, pre uh, I mean, I'm very honored to be one of the people that share, that. that to, uh, the, to get the Abel Prize because Nash's important work is very important. The Nash embedding theorem, and uh, what happens if you think about it is, is that you have k, uh, you you have n plus k unknowns, so five unknowns say, and you have two equations. Uh, you you have you have uh, uh, you have. Uh, Sorry, k equations for n plus k unknowns. Did I get that? Did I get that right? Anyway, so we set the points which solve such equations as defining an n-dimensional manifold. So I think I got it right. Oh well. Okay. So now we want to minimize. So so we have think of we're in a big Euclidean space, or you know, just think of being in a surface in in three space. And we want to minimize the distance uh, along that surface. Uh, uh, and um, so we write down an integral which minimizes length. Now we come to a problem, and th this all goes back, remember the Greeks didn't know how to describe curves. Well, when we run across this problem, we run across another case where we don't, the description isn't very good, because if we actually parameterize a curve the way we want a curve, we, we have actually, we don't have a, we can just parameterize it in any way we want. We can go along it fast to first and then slow or slow and fast. And the, it turns out the way to handle the problem mathematically is, is to parameterize it according to arc length. And parameterized according to arc length, we minimize not the, velo the norm of the velocity or speed, we minimize the norm of the velocity squared. And that gives us all the answers parameterized by arc length. And uh, so these curves are called geodesics, and they're very important in the development of geometric analysis. Oh, okay, I'm still... Okay, so 19th century mathematics was up to proving the existence of minima. I mean, I'll explain a little bit why that's so. And um, so if we, f again, f uh, this, this, around the turn of the century, this was... Uh, of the, sorry, the turn from the 19th to the 20th century. Uh, this was uh, uh, a question of real interest. Um, uh, the question came up, um, if you have, uh, I'll give the explicit example. If you, the question was, if you have a manifold, uh, how many closed geodesics are there on it? That is, a geodesic that comes back and meets itself. Now, if you're on the regular two-dimensional sphere, you know actually what all the geodesics are. They're the great circles. And uh, notice the great circle that goes around is not minimal because you can actually slide it off. But it is a place where the energy has zero derivative. That is, if you, if you look at the slide, slide the, the circle to the top and the bottom, the first derivative is actually zero. It's, and it, and it, it's the second derivative that actually takes you down. So, so uh, if you have an ordinary sphere, uh, you actually have a lot of closed these closed geodesics. These are circles that are... That, and of course, you do see that if you take two points on here, I'm not, I'm not, oh, here, I'm not, I haven't given this talk a lot. So if you take two different points on here, between here and here, it is minimal. It's just, but when you go up and go past the points and you go from here to here, this is minimal, but this is not minimal around there. And so uh, that, those, uh, that, that, was, that was a phenomena that had been well studied in the, in the uh, 19th century. So if you actually change the shape of this sphere, the question Poincaré asked was, he actually asked, are, are there still three? Now, th that's a little bit of topology to argue that there should be at least three left. But... Um, um, uh, but you see, they would be, they would, but they, you wouldn't have all, uh, all the great circles anymore 
the claim is, is that three of them would survive. And actually, this is a very hard problem, which actually only, uh, was only solved uh, in the last few uh, decades. It's, it's not. Uh, but in fact, um, Burkhoff uh, gave a, a, a positive answer that there was actually one that survived if you deformed the two sphere. So, uh, so the, the, a much more extensive theorem is implied by Morse theory. So I'm, I'm going to explain to you about Morse theory because what I'm talking about, that's a very important idea. <clears throat> Okay, so understanding Morse theory requires quite a bit about the subject of topology, and we don't want to go into that here. That's too <laughs> well. We'll do a little bit, but uh, uh, so we'll think of it as a black box. It's and and I should tell you that at the time Morse, uh, Morse was actually doing his work, the topology he was trying to do was not really f well formulated. So he was actually struggling with proving the theorem about geodesics, but he's also str str struggling with what topology was. And nowadays, of course, it's, a, you, it's something you actually learn. Uh, you certainly take a course in, uh, in topology as an undergraduate in mathematics. But, um, but uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, all graduate students know a little bit about it anyway. But at the, at, at the time that Morse was working, um, the, uh, uh, it, it really wasn't well formulated, which is very interesting because if, so if you try to read his paper, his, his book, actually, it's a book, you'll find yourself struggling from the point of view of the topology more than anything else. Okay, so uh, uh, so the, the the claim is is that that if you have this manifold, remember that it's some extension of the idea of a surface in three dimensional space, that um, you're trying to describe the topological properties in in terms of these shortest distances. And I, I want to also point out that you, you, you think, you've asked the question one way, that is, is there a geodesic? But in fact, one of the most very fundamental applications was the other way around. It's called the Bott periodicity theorem. And there's some manifolds called Lie groups, and we know all the geodesics on them because they're so symmetric, and there's group theory, and there's all this, material, uh, all this stuff we can do. So we know all the ge geodesics on them, but we don't understand their topology. Because, I mean, these are big. Some of these groups are, are very large dimensional, and you, even mathematicians can't think that big. And so, but it turns out that since we know all the geodesics, Morse theory tells us something about the topology. So that's uh, to, to give you some idea of why it's so fundamental. So the, the, the scheme of the proof is, is instructive, and I also, it also explains why, the, historically, why uh, what I'm talking about um, uh, describes some of the history of what I'm trying to talk about. So the way you go about it is, is to solve the problem uh, uh, of geodesics, you take an arbitrary curve and you actually sort of put a bound on the energy of it because you're trying to minimize energy. And so you, 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 it turns out that you divide the curve up into a certain number of points and you solve the problem of the geodesics between nearby points. Now this is something you could do classically. So this could be done, in, it, it, the, people knew they could find the distance between two, two close points classically. And um, so you solve that. Now you actually look at the energy on this broken geodesic. And you actually, now this is a, there's a finite number of points. So this is an energy on a finite number of points. It's a calculus problem. So you know a calculus problem. You know, you know that you know theorems of fact the ex existence of minima. You can take gradient flows. You can do all this, and uh, so what you do is you use the gradient flows on these broken geodesics. Okay, the simplest application is the mountain pass lemma, and this will explain a little bit about topology. Okay, so uh, here I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just draw the picture here. Uh, you could actually do an explicit calculation where you have, uh, I've used new variables u and v so we don't max up with what we said before. So we have z as a function of uh, u and v and uh, uh, it, so, so we have z as a function of u and v. 
And uh, so F here, I'm sorry, this is actually A. Uh, uh, this is our action is Z this time. So we're way down in two dimensions instead of looking at curves, and we're looking at, function, at minimizing the, the height function. Now, if I take two points, P and Q prime, uh, and I try to connect them with a, with a, with a, uh, uh, with a path, I actually, uh, I can make the, 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 the path go down as far as I want. Um, so I can actually connect P and Q by a curve that stays at the same level. It doesn't. But now if I take the Q on the other side of the saddle. The, oh, by the way, this is a potato chip. We always called it a saddle when I was a kid, but it's now called a potato chip. So you want to go from here to here, and you want to go with uh, uh, you want to go so you take the minimum of the maximum along the path. So you go along here, and you say, "Oh, I, I, this is the maximum here," and you say, "Well, I could have gone down a little bit," and you test it out, and then you discover that, yes, the minimum of the maximum is this point here, which is a critical point, but not a minima. But notice it has one direction up and one direction down. So that's, <clears throat> anyway. Okay. So we're, get, we're, we're getting there. So uh, now we come to, uh, many physics problems are defined using integrals that depend on functions of more than one variable. Uh, we can define the Laplace operator, which I, I hope some people are familiar with anyway, uh, with, of two independent variables. So we're replacing t by x and y now. And uh, we write the, uh, this is the action integral, which is naturally, it's really just the norm squared of the gradient integrated over a region. And if we actually do the, look at the Euler-Lagrange equations, we get the Laplacian divergence of the gradient equals zero. So that's, uh, and the equations are also, uh, remember F is always the unknown in my problem. And uh, notice that wave equations are also described this way, and this is actually considered an important fact in physics, but there's no way you ever find a minimum for a wave equation. I mean, you have the, the uh, you, can't, you, uh, you can't find a minimum and you can't find a maximum. You can find a stationary equation, uh, stationary F, because it's stationary if it solves the, the wave equation, the usual wave equation in X and T. Uh, it, it's a stationary point for this, but it's not a minimum. Okay, so uh, it, it, this is, I am talking about one of Hilbert's problems, okay? Hilbert was, uh, um, uh, had lit, uh, at the 1900, uh, listed a, a famous set of problems. This is his last problem. And it's unlike, I, I've written it out. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to go into it. I think I'm running out of time, but... Um, uh, but he, he, he says in general, what he basically says is, is that we don't know anything about the calculus of variations in more than one independent variable. And we've got, now we've got all these problems with uh, two independent variables. And uh, I, I, should, I should, I throw in here at the point that this, there's this guy from Weierstrass from, uh, from the uh, 19th, uh, end of the 19th century who actually showed that a lot of things that mathematicians assumed were true, like you could find a minimum, just weren't true. And so they knew at this point that there were a real lot of problems. And it took most of the 20th century to actually shed any clarity on this question. <clears throat> so we come down, we're coming down to uh, uh, my life in mathematics. Okay, uh, and that's what I've called the section I've called infinite dimensional manifolds and the Pauli smell condition, and um, so, so uh, at least the partial solution, or the, uh, in uh, in the early part of the twentieth uh, uh, century, was a partial solution of Hilbert's problem, and it involves introducing function spaces. Now, I, I don't, um, function spaces are uh, putting norms on spaces and functions. 
So Fourier series give you a method of that. You have a function, and you take its Fourier series, then you notice it has an infinite number of coefficients, and you can think of those coefficients as coordinates describing the function. So you can either... Th this is very important in quantum mechanics, that you, can think of, that you can think of a function as being an infinite number of variables. Unfortunately, Fourier series are not a good way to go about solving calculus variations problem. So, and the, the work, for the topological applications, the real problem was to do the functions of one variable. We approximated it by a finite dimensional set, uh, a, 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 a finite number of points that sat in a manifold. And that was, so, so we were actually uh, approximating the problem by a finite dimensional problem. And from calculus uh, that was developed during the 19th century, one knew how to handle these problems of a finite number of variables. But it's, they really tried. They really tried. They took, you, you have a function on a plane, and you're trying to figure out a way to approximate it. And so how are you going to do this? Well, in fact, of course, in, with computers, we do it real easy. We just put a whole bunch of points on it, and we take a lot of difference quotients, and uh, we actually approximate all the derivatives by difference quotients and so forth. But they didn't have computers. And, uh, the, the, uh, and, and, uh, and also, uh, uh, sort of, for rigorous mathematics, it's, not, it's a little bit hard to take that approach. But um, so the, uh, the, 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 sol the solution that uh, was uh, discovered in the early part of the 20th century was is that we use these function spaces. Um, so, <clears throat> so now we come to the question of uh, how we treat problems like um, uh, the geodesic problem. I mean, a typical example, if you really want to, is, is that, uh, of course, uh, the typical example that's easiest to explain is the plateau problem, which is you have a curve in three space and you want to put a minimal surface, area surface in it. But if you have a curved space, ta a space uh, if it's curved, then uh, the problem of even setting up the problem becomes difficult because uh, you, you don't, you, you, you don't, you don't really have the right tools. And it turned out, so what the solution that actually of solving these, these geometric calculus problem, uh, calculus variations problem with more than one independent variable was to introduce uh, infinite dimensional manifolds. And this was done in, uh, mostly in the 60s, I think. I'm not, uh, when I was a student, you see. So, uh, uh, so we, we introduce infinite dimensional manifolds, and I'm calling these, di these manifolds, I'm calling the space X is your function space. Now, the function X is a Hilbert space, or a, a Hilbert space with, uh, with uh, or a functions with one derivative in a Hilbert space, or it's the space of C infinity functions, or there are many different kinds of spaces. You can actually, uh, I mean, there are so many different kinds of spaces. They have different norms on them. They're all no spaces of functions, but you put w different ways of computing the distance between the two functions. You can take the maximum of the distance over points between the two functions, or you can take the integral of the distance between two points over the functions. And <clears throat> here, and so there are two manifolds involved. One is the manifold that you start with. We can actually really think of starting with uh, a two-dimensional plane for the easiest case. And we want to map it, in, uh, we want to look at the space of functions that go from a plane into a curved space. And uh, <clears throat> it is the dimension of n that's important, okay? That's Remember, we couldn't go from one independent variable to two independent variables with the classical notions. So we had to. Uh, so so uh, we want, we couldn't go from one to two without actually changing the way we did things. And in two dimensions, 
Uh, it's the uh, dimension of M, M, which is important. And uh, all the analysis is based on the linear analysis in the function space of maps from your, say, two-dimensional object into a Euclidean space, which is a linear space which you understand. And the, you also have people that you could go and ask questions to and they, about them. And uh, <coughs> uh, so, so what, 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 the, what the manifold is, uh, is the, the, geometrically the space is the space of, uh, it's the space of functions in the linear vector space of maps into Euclidean space uh, that actually sit in tie the manifold. We're using the Nash embedding theorem again. I mean, that, that's, you know, the Nash embedding theorem is not absolutely essential. You can do it without the Nash embedding theorem, but it simplifies, uh, it simplifies like pages of work to use it. So it's, uh, <clears throat> so it was very exciting to discover that calculus works under all the right conditions. Okay, you could actually do calculus in infinite dimensions. Now, you think, and, and, and you know, people are really kind of, how do you think about infinite dimensions? Well, functions are infinite dimensions, so you have to think about functions, and then you know. So what you find, discover about in infinite dimensions is that ordinary differential equations could be solved. You use the same proof. I mean, uh, as you do in your ordinary differential equations. The inverse function theorems are true. Not only that, the same proof works. You have norms and distances and so forth, and you do it in two dimensions, and you can do it in infinite dimensions. And uh, you, can, you can also set up concepts of measuring distance. Uh, and uh, I also mentioned, uh, I noticed that uh, uh, also there was sort of an indication that this was a really interesting area of endeavor because the Atiyah Singer index theorem could connect the dimensions of spaces of solutions with the topology of the manifolds you were working on. So it was a clue that there was something really interesting going on. I mentioned Atiyah and Singer both have Abel prices. So, <coughs> so, so the, uh, for the calculus of variations, the, um, the important thing is the, is the palais smell condition. Okay, and uh, the Pallas male condition basically is a condition that says if we have a bound on the function, remember act, our action integrals, what we're trying to find out something about, we're trying to minimize it or we're trying to actually find a, a saddle point or something. And uh, so we have the, the size of A is bounded, but the gradient when we compute it, uh, and we have a sequence of points on which A is bounded, and we have a sequence of points along which the derivative goes to zero. Uh, but, by the way, this, so, so we're actually following a gradient curve, and we're trying to figure out where the gradient curve goes. And the, the pallet smell condition is a condition that says it's a condition. You have to say the functional satisfies the pallet smell condition. And uh, it's used to show the curves of gradient descent have limit points. Okay. So, in fact... This found a lot of applications to the mountain pass lemma. It gives an easy proof of Morse theory for the geodesics, and it gives uh, very many, many applications of the mountain pass theorem. <clears throat> so, in fact, however, it's interesting that it was not accepted as being a very excited thing. It was way overblown. We didn't really, it didn't really do everything it promised to. This was a new subject, a whole new idea, a whole new way of approaching things, but it wasn't all that great. And I think it's really interesting to make that point. It isn't when something happens that's useful that everybody jumps on the bus. I mean, there's always these people saying, oh, no, you do it the old way. We don't want to do it this way. So uh, I also want to point out that the one that bothers me the most is, is you can't integrate in infinite dimensions. And so you can't do quantum field theory as rigorously in mathematics at all. And uh, that, that bugs me the most. But uh, OK. <laughs> so this gives uh, a, a quick, um, oh, I'm, I'm running out of time. But uh, the, the, this, is, this is really this sets the stage for the work and theorem for myself and current theorems in the calculus of variations in the last 40 years, which has been uh, the time period with that. And what it, we now have a, uh, a classification problem that we usually have a, a, a set of problems that we can define in any dimension. 
and the dimension always being the, the number of independent variables. And if the Pallet smell condition is true, is valid, or with other conditions, it's below the critical condition and it's Pallet smell. If it's a scale invariant problem, it's called borderline. And those are a lot of interesting problems. Minimal, uh, minimal surfaces, uh, Yang Mills equations, and so forth fall into that. And above the critical dimensions, the singularity, singularities always exist. So that answers Hilbert's problem. Forget that one. There's singularities and holes in the thing, and it's a mess. So we still study that. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at the singularities. But uh, okay. Well, I want to stop this. Uh, on. <coughs> Sorry. Oh. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what follows? Oh. Yeah. And I, I, should, I should say something about, so actually, I actually study, most of the work I'm less known for is for the scale invariant case. And what you do is you add a little bit to the functional, and it's palais male, and then you take the little bit away and you see what happens. And I think probably Robert Bryant's going to tell you a little bit about actually what happens in that case. So, okay. so I, I really want to get to the end. So what, what, what looks interesting? Well, you know, people keep on asking me what sort of math you could do, and the answer is if I knew, I'd be there. But anyway, I have to talk. I've heard so many talks on this, I have to mention it. And this is the question of uh, deep learning in computer science. And computer, uh, so computer, this is really hot. I mean, uh, and uh, uh, it's not hot in mathematics, but it's hot in computer science, and you can easily hear a talk. Here we have um, our F now is uh, a, uh, our unknown is uh, the, uh, well, there's first of all a, uh, a fine. We have a, a finite num number of uh, of a sample, and you should think of the sample as being a whole bunch of people. Uh, I don't like to use the, they 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 use pictures, but that's I mean photographs, but that's not good because you're thinking space there. Don't think space. A whole bunch of samples, like a list of people and their medical uh, records of, you know, what, they're, what they're, they measured and so forth. And then you say, you look at some outcome, and that's, when did they die? It could be two things, when did they die, and did they die of cancer or not, or something like that. It could be ten things, but it's usually only a small number. And, and um, uh, so, uh, the, pro the, the, the way it goes about is, is that um, you, ha you have this sample, and now you want to predict somebody not in the sample. So what's done is, is the deep learning involves a very complicated method of constructing po possible maps from, the from elements in the sample to the outcomes. And that's the deep part of it. It's very complicated, and the computer scientists will tell you all about it at extent. But what we want to do is understanding what they're doing. And uh, <laughs> so, so uh, th this... this uh, uh, it's a very large set, but it's a finite dimensional one, and it's very important. And how it's constructed is very important at its finite dimension. And the problem is, is to minimize a loss functional, which is our A again. But now this is still a calculus problem, because we're in finite, we only have a, 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 a finite, it's F that's finite. We only have a finite number of choices of ways to go from the people to uh, from the people's data to the outcome of whether they die, and it's a calculus problem because it's 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 it, 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 and so gradient descent. It, uh, uh, gradient descent methods work. They work fantastically. They work beautifully. You put all this stuff on the computer and you tell it to find the, the best function, and it does. It gives you an F bar, and not only, so there's a lot of interesting things about this. The trouble is, is they don't really know what's going on. They're doing it, and it's a, it's a magic kind of thing. It's not a calculus of variations problem because there's a sum here which you like to make an integral but there's no way. How are you going to get 
a dx in this, or you know, where where is that? There, there's it doesn't. It's not a calculus of variation, and there's no integral involved. And gradient descent gives an answer just because computers are great at that. They've been doing that ever since computers were invented, and they really know how to dig gradient. They don't know how to construct the functions. That space of functions is an art, but uh, and. And in the actual facts, the loss function is usually very close to zero. So, in fact, the F bar found by the computer actually gives the right answer for all the sample that you've got, pretty much. Uh, so, so, and it, now, so what happens? Well, then you go out and test your F bar, and it's really good. <laughs> and the question, uh, so, so. Uh, so let's, we come to the, uh, oh, I really, okay. Uh, now, the, the, there are two things. The loss function is not convex, and there are presumably lots of saddle points. And in fact, they know this from the, from the computer experiments. And there are many minima. And why do the choice, and the question is, why does this work? And uh, computer science talks for math department, uh, for math audiences, talk about the, they, they're very confusing about choosing X. But, um, uh, but they do always end up with, uh, why is this working because the function is not convex? And why is it, uh, why, why is F bar good? And I want to I want to point out the first obvious thing is you can easily construct. We're mathematicians. We don't stick to the facts. We can easily find data that actually doesn't fit this at all. And uh, the second thing is is that um, uh, uh, I have a young colleague at the institute who's one of the few mathemati pure mathematicians thinking about this, and uh, she says that she, uh, she can prove that if if there is a minimum where a of f is zero, then in fact there's a whole big dimensional space of them. There's lots of minimum. You can actually rigorously prove this mathematically. So the question is, is why are the ones that they're finding so good? Anyway, so I have to say, there my, I, my conjecture is, is there's some interesting mathematics going on of some sort that I have no idea. Anyway. <laughs>